Our next presenter is Dr. Raksha Jain, the medical director of the Adult CF program at the University of Texas Southwestern in Dallas, which serves over 250 patients. In addition to her clinical duties, Dr. Jane is also a researcher and has participated in numerous national clinical trials while conducting her own research on sex hormones and how they affect those with CF in terms of airway disease and immunity. And if that isn't enough, Dr. Jane is an assistant professor of pulmonary and critical care medicine at the university. Please help me welcome Dr. Jane for her presentation, Sex Hormones and Their Impact on Gender Disparities in CF Health. All right, thank you very much. I very much want to thank the leadership at the CFRFI for inviting me. I'm very excited to be here, and I'm, I've been really impressed with actually the quality of the talks and the community here. I was really unfamiliar with it, and I'm hoping now we can create something like this down in Texas, but I'm sure it will take many, many years. Um, so today I really want to focus on a topic that I don't think has been discussed much this conference and or honestly at very many conferences and that is sex hormones and their impact on gender disparities in CF health. Now I think this is actually um, starting to get a little bit more attention but honestly there is not yet a lot of data out there but you'll see a lot of the data is preclinical and I think what we really need to do from here is move towards some of the more clinical data. <clears throat> so in terms of conflicts of interest, I do have do some consulting with Vertex, speak for Novartis, and have grant funding from both from the NIH, CF Foundation, and Gilead Sciences, but none of that is related to anything I'll be discussing today. So to outline what we're, I'm going to be going through, my goal is to focus a little bit about what's known on the epidemiology of sex-based differences in outcomes in CF, go through and focus a little bit on the pathogen profile and how they're different between men and women move a little bit into what the hypothesis is behind these sex-based differences, and then spend the bulk of the time on sex hormones and what we know about how they may be impacting Pseudomonas aeruginosa in particular, it, their role in a pro-inflammatory response in CF, and finally how they may be related to immunity and neutrophil dysfunction, and then end briefly with a clinical trial our own center is doing to try to understand this a little bit better. Okay, so as most of you in this room know, cystic fibrosis is an autosomal recessive disease. And as a result of the inheritance pattern, the prevalence of, in males and females is equal. However, it has been noted, and it was first described back in the 1980s, that, that men and women are a little bit different in terms of their outcomes. And in fact, in England, it was first reported in the late 1980s that the odds ratio or risk of death in, in males was about 1.47 versus a much higher risk in females of 2.75. And this was similarly reported looking at Canadian CF registry. Here in the United States, it was in the late 1990s um, that Dr. Rosenfeld and her group uh, looked at CF Foundation US patient registry for the first time and actually tracked the survival. And if you see here, this is what's called a Kaplan-Meier curve, where it's showing um, survival, there we go, survival over here, survival probability over age. And it's a little bit difficult to see, but that bottom line right here is females, and this top line is males. And when you look at the median survival, and again, this was data in the the 80s and 90s, so the median survival was much different then. <clears throat> but she found that in males, the median survival was about 28.4, and in females, 25.3. So a fairly large difference. She did a variety of factors, or a variety of analyses to try to control for other factors that might be impacting that, and found that despite controlling for these other factors, this disparity still exists. So of course, this was done in the 80s and 90s, and CF care has changed quite a bit, and everybody is living longer and healthier lives, thank goodness, but, but then the question came, is this disparity really still there, or have we overcome it with what we're doing for care, with care? So actually, our group set out to answer that, because when I began this research, I think that was the, one of the first questions to really look at, is is it still relevant, and is this disparity still there? So we very similarly took much more recent CF data in the, in the late 2000s now, and published this about a couple years ago, where we looked at US patient registry data, had over 30,000 patients included in this analysis, and did, again, a simple, simple Kaplan-Meier curve, where you see here the females and the males, and actually it still came out 
that the median life expectancy at the time we did this analysis was 36 in women and 38.7 in men. And when you look at the general population, so the publication of what is actually the, the predicted uh, survival in men and women as a whole in the United States, for women it's 80.9 and for men it's 76.3. So you think about CF and actually the difference between the general whole population and CF leaves about a seven year disadvantage for females that we really don't understand. We went through and we, con we did a big multivariate analysis controlling for all sorts of different things that impact um, survival and outcomes in CF, including um, BMI or weight. We included genotypes, we included pancreatic insufficiency, we included diabetes, we included all sorts of bacteria, and found that despite for controlling for all of these different factors, there was still an increased what we call hazard ratio or risk of death in women that was actually about 2.2, which is quite large. So then the question lies in, why is this? So as part of our analysis, we also went through and looked at the microbiologic profile quite a bit. And at the time that Dr. Rosenfeld had done her analysis, the registry wasn't quite as robust, or the United States registry didn't have all the data it has now. So we were able to take a fairly good look at this and looked at a variety of pathogens. Um, and if you, I know this is a little bit busy slide, let me focus a little on a couple here, and that is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So this is just a table looking at males on the top line. I don't know if this is coming through real well males on this top line and females on the bottom line, and a, and a variety of common pathogens seen in CF. And you can see when it comes to, that what we looked at was age of acquisition of these bugs. When were they first getting this? And we found that females, for the most part, across the board are found to have an earlier incidence of these pathogens being described. And I just point out a couple, and that is Pseudomonas aeruginosa, where the difference was fairly large, and actually the other is non-tuberculous mycobacterium, where the um, mean age of first acquisition of this in men is about 16.3, and in women about 14.7, or boys and girls, I should say. Um, and so this, you know, this at least struck our interest of what is it about this, but I think the other important thing to note is that a lot of these ages of acquisition are actually even pre-puberty. So I don't think this is all hormonal related, and I hope to outline that in this discussion. I think sex hormones are just one component, but I actually think there's a multifactorial reason for why this is occurring that we don't yet understand. So other groups had taken note of this interest and, and already had described a few things when it comes to Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And I'm gonna spend a large amount of the talk talking about that, I think, because it's such a prevalent and pathogenic organism in cystic fibrosis. But this was a group that looked at Pseudomonas aeruginosa um, in, in terms of FEV1 over in, in patients that don't have Pseudomonas, those who have non-mucoid and those who have mucoid Pseudomonas, and tracked the difference between females and males, and you'll see that overall females in all groups really did a little bit worse when it came to FEV1. Then they looked at survival in those who acquired Pseudomonas, what they call early, or less than six years of age, and those who acquired it late. And you see really that beyond this, the difference really expands, particularly in those who acquire Pseudomonas early, where the females are doing worse. So there's definitely a, a inklings out there in the literature that there's something about how men and women are handing, handling pathogens in CF, that there's something we don't understand, but is giving women somewhat of a disadvantage. So CF is not the only place where this has been described, and I think this is also important because one of the questions that would come to mind immediately is there is something about CFTR that's resulting in this. And some of this data would suggest not necessarily. So actually other airway diseases have a similar pattern that's been described of a disparity between men and women. You look at asthma, and it's been well described that there's a higher prevalence of asthma in boys relative to girls, or young boys relative to girls. However, after puberty, that changes distinctly where it becomes much more prevalent in women relative to men. In fact, in adulthood, the prevalence of asthma in women is 50% higher that of, than that of men. And actually, it's been reported that women are 40% more likely to die from asthma. So there's something out there about airway disease in general, and we've actually similarly seen this in COPD, non-CF bronchiectasis, where, for example, there's a very clear description that when it comes to non-tuberculous mycobacterium in, in non-CF bronchiectasis, that there's a higher prevalence in women. And even now, there's emerging literature in lung cancer that, that women are at higher risk for lung cancers, particularly non-small cell lung cancer, whether they smoke or don't smoke. So I think there's a trail of things that we can learn within CF and outside of CF or what might be causing this, what are the links between these, and what could we do about it? 
So when you, then you want to stop and say, what are the different hypotheses of why this may be occurring? And I'm mostly from here on going to focus on cystic fibrosis, but I think the very first one that comes to mind is, is size and nutritional status. And so, you know, once pe people once thought, okay, that women are often more petite, um, are their airways smaller? Is this a reason that they're having, that this is occurring? And it's very difficult to know because I don't think we have yet looked at this from a radiologic standpoint, but at least when you control in these studies for BMI and, and height, which also will be a, a surrogate for lung size, it doesn't come out as influencing this disparity. So at least we don't think that's a huge reason, but it may be a component. Adherence to therapies is always another one that comes out as could that be influencing it? And to my knowledge, there's not any literature to suggest that there's a difference between the adherence to therapies between men and women with CF. And then another one that comes out is comorbidities. And um, the two ones that really stand out are diabetes and nutritional status. And there actually has been some literature out there to suggest that women with CF are at higher risk for developing diabetes than men, but we don't yet have any literature to suggest that they do worse with diabetes than men. And in addition, in, in the studies that I showed already about um, survival and outcomes, diabetes was one of the factors placed in there in terms of controlling whether that's impacting the outcomes, and it did not impact the outcomes though that may have its own area that we need to understand better. The other is nutritional status in terms of women are often um, a little lighter in their BMI and, and sometimes less well-nourished, and could that be a factor? But we again controlled for BMI and nutritional factor in many of these studies and found that regardless of this, there is still this disadvantage that exists. Now another big one that I have to say there's not a lot of data out there on yet is physical activity. As we all know, exercise is incredibly beneficial to CF. And I think this is an area that would be interesting to look at, but there's not really been much purported out there on whether men and women are differentially exercising. I think we can hypothesize that it is potentially likely that boys or men may exercise more than women, but I don't think we know that. Um, but that may be another hypothesis out there that we need to explore. But the one I'm really going to focus on quite a bit in this talk is sex hormones, because naturally when you get this difference between men and women and you've controlled for a variety of other factors, the thing that really stands out is could it be, can it be sex hormones that are influencing CF? So in order to talk about this, I just want to introduce, many of you know this, um, but just to introduce what are the important hormones and what is it about them that we can learn or gain from. So as most of you know, estrogen and progesterone are the predominant female sex hormones. They vary during ovulatory cycles. They vary during pregnancy. They vary throughout the lifetime. And in general, 17-beta estradiol is the more active form of estrogen and the dominant form of estrogen in women. And it is about five to 10 times higher than men in general, though it fluctuates, as I said. Progesterone, the other major um, female sex hormone, is just modestly higher than that in women. It's generally maybe about anywhere from two to ten times higher than that of that than men. Excuse me. And and importantly, and I think people often wonder this: are are these hormones? in the same in CF women as they are in the general population. And actually, from what we can gather, yes. And um, in fact, we have some data to suggest that's the case as well, that at least when women are well nourished, their female sex hormones mimic that of what's seen in the general population. So testosterone, the dominant sex hormone in men, um, is typically actually about 10 to 20 times higher in males than females. Now this is interesting, and there's really, as you're gonna find, a, a dearth of information on testosterone and CF as of yet. But what we do know is that there has been several descriptions now where adolescent men with CF do have lower testosterone levels, described as being at least two standard deviations below normal than, um, than non-CF men. And why that is, I don't think we know yet, nor do we necessarily know whether it's the right thing to do to replace this, to supplement testosterone, et cetera. So I think there's still a lot of questions that remain about this. So and from here forward, there's gonna be a little bit of biology about these hormones, and so I just wanna introduce you a little bit to how some, most of these hormones work. And that's a general pattern of the estrogen, progesterone, androgens, or testosterone. They're all ligands, and they all have receptor hor um, hormones or receptors for them. And so for estrogen, there's um, predominant what we call nuclear receptors, which mean that typically when they bind estrogen, as you see out here, these little yellow molecules are ligands, and um, they have these, this receptor that often sits on the surface, but then translocates the nucleus where it acts on your genes. Also, we've learned a lot over time that these receptors have a lot of non-nuclear phenomenon or what we call rapid non-genomic effects as well. And as we understand more about the biology of these hormones, we can understand more about what they're doing at the cellular level. 
But importantly, what I do want to say is when it comes to estrogen receptor, progesterone receptors, and androgen or testosterone receptors, they are all present in the lung. They're all present in bronchial epithelial cells, and they're also, many of them have been described to be present in our immune cells, such as neutrophils, macrophages, et cetera. So there have been a couple reports out there within CF to suggest, and I'm sure many of you who either care for patients with CF or have CF yourselves may have experienced things where I know I've had folks come to clinic and say, I feel better when I'm either on my period or not on my period, or I feel worse when I'm ovulating, or and is this related to my CF? And I think this is one of, really one of the things that sparked my interest in this is that's a very legitimate question, and do we know the answer? And I think the sad thing is we don't yet, but there are hints out there that, that we might start learning about it. So one of the first articles I think that was published about this was um, back in 2000 where a group attempted to look at CF women and figure out whether there was a difference in their lung function at various points in their, in their ovulatory cycles. So here you see um, this is FEV1 on the y-axis and their luteal phase, which is actually a point of both, both moderately elevated estrogen and progesterone levels. It occurs about two weeks after um, ovulation versus um, menses when both estrogen and progesterone levels are really at their lowest during a normal ovulatory cycle. So you see here that this group interestingly found that at menses, they found the FEV1 to be statistically lower than at the luteal phase. Now I'll tell you, when you really read some of these, that was their take home point in their abstract, but to when you read through the, the actual paper, surprisingly, they only had 12 women in this, in this um, study, and in addition, actually, the women were on a mix of birth control on and off. And that makes a big difference because generally, oral contraceptive therapy suppresses your endogenous hormone, so that fluctuation that you would generally see is actually um, quite plateaued, and so it's really not quite the best way to study it because you're really going to be getting a mixture of what those hormones were. So I think you have to take some of these studies with a grain of salt when they haven't well done a good job controlling for these different things. So the next really big study that came out, and this was a very nice paper that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2012, was on estrogen and its impact on CF exacerbations. So this was a group out of Ireland that actually prospectively looked at, at women in their center and found that when they tracked estrogen levels and pulmonary exacerbations, so you see here on the y-axis in this first graph is number of pulmonary exacerbations. The bottom is the point in the cycle that these women are and the, um, the bar graph stand for the estrogen levels. So you see that as the estrogen level goes up here, which correlates with ovulation, they saw a significant increase in the number of exacerbations in their patients. Now, the tricky thing is you have to think of how did they track that? Was that when the patient first reported their exacerbations? And I don't think we're ever going to know the full detail of that because I think, as we all know, sometimes we as physicians and sometimes as patients are a little low, late in telling each other that this is happening or being aware that this is happening. So tracking that point is tough, but either way, it was quite an interesting trend, and they had a good number of patients that they studied in this. The other thing they did that was also very interesting is they looked at, at patients when they were stable and, and assessed their hormone levels, and patients when they were sick or exacerbating and assessed their hormone levels, specifically estrogen. And in black here is women with CF, this little clear dot is women with CF who are on oral contraceptive therapies, and this, I guess, gray colored is men with CF. So you see here when, when people are stable, the estrogen level is, of course, a little higher in these women not on CF, but overall not hugely different. But you see in the point where they're exacerbating, they really found a pretty interesting elevation in estrogen levels at that time, which supported this graph quite a bit. So very interesting and really the first time this had been reported and seen. So our group actually took a, this similar question, um, but with a different angle, and that is we used um, CF Foundation Patient Registry again to actually look at the impact of puberty on, on CF exacerbations. Now this is really tricky because while the US CF um, Foundation Patient Registry is wonderful, there are a few points that it lacks in terms of being able to study this topic. And that is one, there's not a lot of data about menarche, um, when that's happening, puberty when that's happening, or oral contraceptive therapy. A lot of these things that I think it would be helpful to have to learn more about this. So what we had to do was we used peak height velocity as a surrogate for puberty, and that's been well described in some of the endocrine literature. So height is in the registry very clear, and what we did is we had to calculate for every individual patient what their peak point of height velocity was as their marker of puberty. And we found that when you look at time zero here in the middle as their point of puberty, 
I'm doing terrible with this, um, there we go. Okay, so when you look at time zeros, their point of puberty, and number of exacerbations 10 years pre-puberty versus 10 years post-puberty, you see that males and females, at a, you know, 10 years pre-puberty were pretty similar in their number of exacerbations. They both increased post-puberty, as you would expect, but you see about five years post-puberty that the women start to separate themselves as having a higher number of exacerbations relative to men. Um, and why this is, I can't say that we could, we could understand from this study yet, but I think it's important to note that, that it was there. And again, we controlled for a variety of important things that may influence this, from BMI to diabetes, et cetera, and still found that this existed. The other thing that you may be wondering, which I think was interesting in itself, was finding out what the age of puberty was, because many people have suggested that CF may result in delayed puberty in, in patients. And I think many years ago, that was likely the case, but actually this allowed us a very nice, robust way of looking at this, because again, this was a study of about 30,000 patients, and when we used this peak height velocity as a surrogate for puberty, and compared that with US national data in the global population of when puberty is using the same marker, that um, the general population has an age of puberty that's about 13.4 in males and 11.8 in females. When, with our study, we found that that was really not that different from what we found, fortunately. So, so about 13.1 years of age in males and 11.1 in females. However, when we did actually factor in those and separate out, and I didn't show this data, but when we separate those out with very low BMIs, which would be called malnourished, versus those who had appropriate BMIs, this did change. So actually the low BMIs did influence the point of puberty where we found that it was delayed when someone was um, malnourished. Okay, so with that, that gives you a host of epidemiologic data that really is suggesting that there is a clear difference of some sort between men and women with CF, and that there's something that may be influencing why women may not be doing as well as men. And so what can these be? And when you really look at the pathophysiology of CF, I think as we all know, we've got our abnormal CFTR that causes a, reduced, a reduction in air surface liquid and impaired mucociliary clearance. This results in this vicious cycle of infection, obstruction, and inflammation. So what I'm now going to move a little bit into is what does the preclinical data show us that modulation of estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor and or anything about androgen receptors, what, what aspects of this do they target? And I think as you're going to find, there's several suggestions out there that they may be targeting several components of this pathophysiology. All right, so this was actually still that, that New England Journal paper that I cited a few minutes ago, looked at directly at the influence of estrogen on pseudomonas. So what they found was, was interesting, and unfortunately it has not been able to be reproduced as far as I know, but it was interesting nonetheless, where they showed that there was not a difference necessarily in the growth of pseudomonas with estrogen around, but what they showed is that estrogen was influencing pseudomonas changing from a non-mucoid to a mucoid state. So mucoidy is, is when pseudomonas secretes an alginate-like material, almost a coating around itself that protects itself from many of our, our immune, uh, immune capacities. And so it's thought that mucoid pseudomonas is more virulent than non-mucoid. So this group, um, again out of Ireland, showed that alginate here, which is on the left-hand side, um, as you can see marked here, in, in folks who, they use a non-clinical PAO1 strain and cl clinical strain taken from CF subjects and found that estradiol, as you can see in this bar here, there was a significant increase of um, mucoidy in this pseudomonas when treated in vitro with estrogen. They similarly showed some histologic slides of this where you can see here that in control, these are all a non-mucoid form of pseudomonas. This kind of thick colony you can see here is the alginate around the pseudomonas that they saw it convert as it was exposed to estrogen. Now this was after it being exposed to these hormones daily for about four weeks. And then they saw that there was really no impact on testosterone. They similarly looked at this in their patients, which was pretty interesting, and saw, and this is a pretty busy slide here, but if you look, they saw, they tracked here the non-mucoid in blue, the mucoid um, in this in this black, and everybody as a whole, or all their pseudomonas in red. And so you see that this was the general pattern. When they took the mucoid pseudomonas, it, it peaked here at the point of which estrogen was high. Again, I'm sorry, this red graph is estrogen. So when estrogen was high, the mucoid pseudomonas was also at its highest, the non-mucoid at its lowest. And this was taking samples real time from their patients at these different points in time. 
So that was really the first suggestion we've had that hormones may directly influence bacteria. And I'll tell you, one of the criticisms of this is that that strain of Pseudomonas that they used, PA01, which is one that a lot of CF studies do use, actually in its genome does not have any estrogen receptors. And as far as we know, doesn't have any hormone receptors. So that was quite surprising. Whether or not there's an off-target effect to the estrogen might be possible, but we at least don't think that is necessarily driven by something it's directly doing to the estrogen receptor. So from there, others, and um, this was actually some work that I did when I was a fellow, we looked at different, other different aspects of what the hormones could be doing on the airway epithelial cells. So progesterone has actually got, not gotten a lot of, um, I think, not had a lot of work done surrounding it, and it wasn't even really known at the time whether progesterone receptors were in the lungs. So we actually took um, some airways, both from, from males and females, and stain them for what you can see here the, in red was progesterone receptor and green alpha tubulin, which is a marker of airway epithelial cells, and co-localized them and found that very clearly these progesterone receptors line the bronchial epithelial cells and are quite prevalent. Then what we did was took these bronchial epithelial cells and measured cilia beat frequency, which is the measure of how fast the cilia are moving on the airway epithelium. It's thought that the faster they move, the better your clearance of pathogens will be out of the lungs. And we found that progesterone actually inhibited this cilia beat frequency, which was actually rescued. It wasn't affected by estrogen alone, but it was rescued by estrogen. And I think this actually is not surprising, and, and in the end is probably a good thing that estrogen and progesterone often balance themselves in a variety of organs, and we find that. And I think um, whether or not that cilia beat frequency is translating to anything in, real, in people, we don't know, but we can at least say there is, there's a balance. And so I think that we're going to find that there's an estrogen and progesterone balance in several other regards and the, the key areas to focus on is where is that balance off and can we affect that. So there's also another nice paper out there that was published by a group in North Carolina, um, and this was a paper that suggested that, that um, sex hormones can actually affect some of the ion channels on the surface of airway epithelial cells. And they actually focused on non-CFT ion channels. And so I don't know if you can see this, but one can measure air surface liquid on the surface of bronchial epithelial cells. And having an appropriate air surface liquid is, is essential. So as you can see in this picture here, it's a very busy picture, but epithelial cells on the surface of the airways are, all, are very polarized. That's where the CFTR channel sits, which is here in red, along with several other ion channels. And as you can see, this yellow layer is what we call our air surface liquid layer. It sits amongst the cilia, and you want that to be there because the, the lungs, of course, are an open cavity with these pathogens, and it's with this liquid layer, with your hair-like cilia, and with a little bit of mucus that we're able to trap pathogens and move them out. One of the big problems in CF is that without the CFTR channel here, that chloride secretion isn't there, sodium reabsorption is disproportionately increased into the cell, and this water layer, therefore, is drawn to be low, and because of this low level, you get relatively increased mucus, less ability to move the cilia, and less pathogen clearance. So what this group proposed, knowing that, is that there's always been a proposal that some of the alternative chloride channels, the non-CFTR channels, might be able to, to compensate a little bit for the lack of CFTR. And they actually found that estrogen was inhibiting one of these calcium-mediated non-CFTR channels. So they proposed that in CF in particular, one of the reasons women may have a little bit of a disadvantage is that when the liquid layer is already low, if this non-CF calcium channel is also being hindered, it's gonna make that surface liquid even lower. And they actually also measured this, and you can see here air surface liquid height over increasing estrogen uh, treatment and found that this air surface liquid height um, went in a log difference of decrease when it was exposed to estrogen. They also actually measured, measured nasal potential difference by stimulating this particular channel and found that this mimicked itself in vivo. So it was a very interesting and probably the first time this had been reported and how we can maybe translate that into therapy I think people are thinking about quite um, hard. So there's been, I'm not going to go into all the details, but there's been a variety of other papers published demonstrating that estrogen and even testosterone may influence several of these other ion channels on the surface when it comes to epithelial sodium channels. And there's even a paper out there that was just published this year that suggests that testosterone may also regulate CFTR expression and in fact increase CFTR expression that was described in the seminal vesicles of rats. And so what the relevance of that in the lungs is, I don't think we know yet. But there's a lot of unanswered questions about which ion 
ion channel is the most important? Can we modulate this? Um, and is this genotype specific? Because there was even one paper out there that suggested that um, estrogen may modulate specifically the, the degradation of CFTR in patients who have delta F508. So I think we have a lot to learn. So what our group, at least my lab, has focused on a lot over the last five to six years is estrogen's role on inflammation and host immunity. So I think as most of you know, inflammation is a key component of CF and there's a, there's a high prevalence of, of, of inflammation that's ongoing and often destructive in the CF lungs. So the question is, is estrogen influencing that and can we modulate that? So I'm gonna move a little bit into some of our in vivo mouse work we've done to look at that. And what we did was we actually started out by using CFTR null mice or CF mice and um, looked simply at female versus male mice. And we controlled for weight, we controlled for age, et cetera, and we exposed these mice to Pseudomonas aeruginosa at levels that um, we could use to test survival. And we found that in red here you'll see um, versus blue that the CF females actually died much faster when exposed to the same Pseudomonas dose um, relative to male mice. When you look at this next graph, this is CFU, which is colony forming units of the bacteria. That is the amount of bacteria that remains in the lungs over time when these mice are exposed to, um, to different things. And so when we gave the male mice pseudomonas versus giving the female mice pseudomonas, you can see here in red that these female mice were unable to clear the pseudomonas at the same rate as the male mice. So at least a suggestion that this survival difference may be due to clearance of the bacteria. Then we wanted to look at, okay, is this really estrogen related? We see the difference in males versus females. And what we did then is we took the, the female mice, we overectomized them, and we supplemented them separately with estrogen and progesterone so we could really break down what's the difference on these two separate hormones and what impact are they having. And in doing the same survival experiment, we exposed them to pseudomonas. You see here in blue, this is just the overectomized mice with a vehicle or a control. These are the mice that were supplemented with progesterone, and these are the mice supplement, supplemented with estrogen, and we found that really it was the estrogen-supplemented mice that did worse. And this, again, mimicked their ability to clear the bacteria, where you see that these estrogen-supplemented mice could not clear the bacteria as well as their control mice or progesterone-supplemented mice. So a very, it's very hard to do these kinds of studies in patients because you can never really segregate out estrogen or progesterone, but that can be done easily in mice, and it was a very good indicator that estrogen is impacting this. So the next thing we wanted to do um, was we, after seeing that, we, that estrogen was impacting the survival here relative to over-optimized mice with vehicle, was can this be changed? Would it matter if we modulate the estrogen receptors? So here we took ICI, and ICI is an estrogen receptor antagonist, meaning it's gonna block the estrogen receptors. So when we took these female mice, regular female mice, not hormone manipulated in any way, and we gave them an estrogen receptor antagonist or blocker, it actually improved their survival, which was quite dramatic and very important because I think this gives us a sign that this can be modulated and potentially repaired if we find the right means to do this. We also took a good look at their, their histology. So when we took these overectomized mice that had been treated with control, treated with a vehicle, versus those treated with estrogen, we actually found that the estrogen-treated mice had a higher amount of inflammation. You can see it with the density of the cells, et cetera, that there's just increased inflammation. When we broke down actual cytokines, which is what you see here, where you can actually measure different markers of inflammation in the lungs of these mice, that when you see in the vehicle-treated mice that were overectomized females versus those supplemented with estrogen, Estrogen, and, and I would say the vast majority of cytokines that we looked at, we saw there was, an, there was evidence of pro-inflammation in the estrogen-supplemented mice. So all pointing to the fact that at least estrogen in the setting of the lungs when treated with pseudomonas had a pro-inflammatory response. The other interesting thing that came out is we looked at a couple of specific enzymes. One was MPO, which is often thought to be a marker of neutrophils, myeloperoxidase, and one is neutrophil elastase, another major player that's, that is secreted from neutrophils. And we found that both of these were also dramatically increased in the setting of estrogen. So that gave us our first hint that should we be looking at neutrophils in some form? And the first thing we did was actually just look at whether the quantity of neutrophils was different, and we actually did not find that there was a quantitative difference in neutrophils in the mice that were treated with estrogen versus those that weren't. 
But when you really think about the role of neutrophils in CF, we know that, that the CF lung has many, many neutrophils. It's constantly fluxing in because of the bacteria that live there. And those neutrophils are trying to engulf bacteria and kill them. And actually, neutrophils are a big contributor to the viscosity of CF mucus in that when they come in and they try to engulf the bacteria, neutrophils are actually very short lives live cells, and they lyse and secrete all their intracellular contents, a bunch of DNA, et cetera, and all of this contributes to a lot of the scarring in the lung, in particular neutrophil elastase. So our thought was, is there something about these neutrophils, seeing that the neutrophil elastase and this myeloperoxidase were higher in estrogen treatment, yet the quantity of neutrophils was no different, is it that the neutrophils are secreting more, or are they upregulated, what's going on? So we further looked at neutrophils, and this was just a demonstration that the migration into the lung was no different, meaning the quantity was no different. So we set out then to look at function. So when we ne took neutrophils <clears throat> from mice and looked at actually the ability of these neutrophils to <clears throat> excuse me, kill Pseudomonas, we found that when you look here at the side at, at colony forming units again, which is the really a quantification of the amount of Pseudomonas, when you put them in wells, the Pseudomonas and neutrophils together, the neutrophils are naturally going to want to engulf the Pseudomonas and kill it. And you can measure that by the amount of Pseudomonas that's remaining. So you can see with increasing doses of estrogen that we treated these neutrophils with ex vivo or outside of the mouse, we found that the amount of remaining Pseudomonas was higher, so that it was not killing the pseudomonas as well. So that was all well and good. All this has been done with, with mice neutrophils. So the real, next question was, is this something that's going to be relative to our patients? So we actually took neutrophils from our CF female patients. And actually, we used blood neutrophils. This is basically just a donation of blood that our patients made. And we treated the blood with pooled serum, so there was not going to be influence of their endogenous estrogen at the time, and treated them with escalating doses of estrogen, and actually that same estrogen receptor blocker. And you see here that with increasing doses of estrogen, we again saw the remaining pseudomonas to be higher, so the neutrophils were not killing the pseudomonas as well. And when we treated them with a specific estrogen receptor blocker, that that improved to some extent. Not fully, but it improved. So that is a good indication that this is a specific finding that what estrogen is doing is actually through its estrogen receptor. So then we wanted to look at a bit, little bit, and we're still doing a lot of these studies to understand what's the mechanism behind this. Neutrophils have a lot of different things they do, many of which are good and some which are result in some harm. But what we found is this is a very busy but kind of interesting slide of there's a way that you can measure the way that a neutrophil is responding to infection. It's oxidative burst, its ability to activate itself and produce the enzymes it needs to kill. And this is a measure of that. And you can see here that in black is just our, our neutrophils in a vehicle setting, a control setting. The red is when they're treated with estrogen, and this blue is when they received estrogen plus an estrogen receptor antagonist. So you can see with this red curve that the response of these neutrophils was not only higher, but it was also earlier. So there was an earlier or more exuberant activation of these neutrophils that was actually diminished by the blocker, in fact, diminished over baseline, which is great, because again, that says maybe we can do something about it. We also, again, looked in our neutrophil elastase from these human neutrophils and found that when they were exposed to estrogen, that neutrophil elastase was higher, all pointing to them having a different form of activity under estrogen exposure. We looked at another important role of neutrophils, and that is phagocytosis, the ability of a neutrophil to engulf a bacteria and kill it, and found that that ability was decreased with exposing increasing levels of estrogen. And finally, in this graph here, we looked at what's called cytotoxicity, which is the, um, the length of time the neutrophils are alive. As I mentioned, they're very short half-life half -life cells, and things kill them very easily. And when you look at a control setting versus estrogen setting versus estrogen with an antagonist setting, that you see that, that when estrogen is around, these cells die at a much faster rate. So putting all this together, We've sort of developed the hypothesis, at least, that in the setting of estrogen, the neutrophils are overactivated. They lose some of their killing capacity that may be driven by their inability to phagocytose a bacteria, and these cells then die earlier. All of this translating potentially to a diminished host response, though we have, we can, we have to do a lot of work before we can say, say that for sure, but at least there's some preclinical evidence suggesting this. So just to summarize what we've found at the lab level so far, we have found that these female CF mice have an increased risk or more susceptibility to Pseudomonas aeruginosa infections relative to male mice, that this is definitely mediated by estrogen and estrogen receptors, 
that there is a pro-inflammatory response in the presence of estrogen, and that somehow this estrogen is enhancing neutrophil activation and degranulation, or the ability of it to kill and lyse things, in a way that it's not able to phagocytose bacteria and ultimately results in earlier death in the neutrophils and in a diminished ability for these neutrophils to kill bacteria. So coming back to this slide, what I've hopefully shown you a little bit is that there is evidence out there that the estrogen receptor in particular and maybe androgen receptors are impacting CFTR function. There's also some preclinical evidence to suggest that estrogen receptors are modulating air surface liquid. There's evidence to suggest that they're impacting infection, especially when it comes to the change from a mucoid, non-mucoid to mucoid pseudomonas. And then there's evidence from our own group suggesting that it impacts inflammation. So the key is with all of that, what can we do about it and what do we know from a clinical standpoint? So with just the last few minutes, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on that. And I think I, I do wanna highlight that there's a lot of unanswered questions despite all this preclinical data that's developing, and that is, can hormone modulation serve as a therapeutic target? And I think the first thing that comes to mind is people say, well, we're not gonna be messing with people's hormones. And I actually don't think we should, and I think that is a real problem when it comes to hormone-based therapy, is that we cannot assume that that just because estrogen or progesterone or testosterone may be bad in one organ, that we can modulate it systemically because they have lots of different roles in different organs. And if we try to attack the estrogen in one organ on a systemic basis, we may cause harm in another organ. So we have to find a way to target the organ that we can, we can try to benefit from. But this comes a lot back into the lecture we heard last night of how do you deliver these things? Where's the right place to deliver it and how do you get it there? Other important questions that I don't think we know yet are what's the role of oral contraceptive therapies? That is a systemic therapy that many patients are on for very good reasons, and is that good, bad? What do we know about that? Um, testosterone, I have not spent a lot of time talking about, and I don't think we should neglect it because the alternative hypothesis to all of this is maybe testosterone's good, but I don't think we have yet the data that people have looked at to study to understand that enough. And then finally, what are the implications on pregnancy, menopause, which I think will be great when, you know, to study that, and we have really neglected that altogether. Um, so there's a lot of questions out there. And I think our group, for the last two years, we have had a prospective clinical trial going to try to understand this better. It's been very slow, and maybe you'll understand why, to enroll patients and to do this. And what we're doing is it's a pilot study looking at some of our own CF female patients in our clinic who are between the ages of 18 and 45. And what we're really doing is focusing on the women who already don't take any form of oral contraceptive therapy, who have regular menstrual cycles, and who might be willing to go on oral contraceptive therapy. And we're following them over natural ovulatory cycles and then on birth control control and measuring a variety of things. We're looking at FEV1, we're looking at CF symptoms, we're looking at um, sweat tests, and we're looking at sputum for a variety of markers, including inflammatory markers, bacterial density, et cetera, and, and neutrophils, and trying to understand, can we delineate real, real time when we're looking prospectively at whether there is differences that are important clinically in a woman when she's naturally ovulating and or when she's on birth control. So I'll just so, show you some of our preliminary data. And actually, since then, we've collected a few more patients but um, have not yet analyzed their data. But at the time of this, we had about nine females who completed this study and five males. Now, importantly, at the time, only um, three or four of these women had actually completed the whole arm of this, including the birth control arm. And our goal was, and when I have the males on there, the males are really meant to be for controls to look at when we follow them, are they... Are, is what we're expecting balanced in the men, or, and are they, are they matching what we would expect the non-hormonal points in women or the menses points to match in these men? So we're taking FEV1 and age match men for the most part to try to um, find the best controls for these women. And as a result, you can see when you just look at the demographics, there's, there is not a difference in age in FEV1 as you would expect. The women were a little bit lighter in their BMI, but not clinically significant. And our goal is to really have the groups not be different. And we looked just a little bit. The first thing we needed to ensure was that the points we were catching this, these women were the correct ones. And so generally, during menses, as I mentioned earlier, your estrogen should be at its lowest. It should elevate during the ovulatory cycle and stay somewhat elevated during the luteal phase. 
and then it, it goes down or suppressed endogenously with, with oral contraceptive therapy. And in this study, we're using low estrin, a combination estrogen, progesterone, oral contraceptive therapy, and compare that with men. And actually, very nicely, when you look at the estrogen levels, it did what we expected in these women. It did what we expected with, um, with use of oral contraceptive therapy. And the men had what we had expect too, which is a similar level to what we would see when a woman is on an oral contraceptive therapy. We also looked at LH, which is a luteal hormone, and it peaks when someone is ovulating and saw the nice peak we would expect at ovulation. We looked at progesterone levels, which are at their highest during that luteal phase, and again saw that very nicely in the women in contrast to the men over here, and looked at testosterone levels in these women and found that they're flat line as you would expect in these women and elevated in the men. So that was probably the most important part to see is that are we capturing these patients at the right point in time? Are their hormone levels what we expected? And they were, which is good because that at least gives um, credence to the fact that this study will hopefully be designed the right way to learn important things from it. So just preliminarily what we've looked at, um, we've looked a little bit at their FEV1, and you see here that during ovulation there's a little bit of a trend towards a decrease in FEV1, and I should say importantly, these patients were all followed when they were well. We did not capture them when they were sick or exacerbating or on antibiotics, and if they got sick in the middle of the study, we just stopped the study and re-enrolled them at a time that they were healthier as long as they were willing. And so all these patients were stable during the study, and we saw a trend towards a little bit of a lower FEV1 here during ovulation where your estrogen peaks, and interestingly, saw a little bit of a trend towards an increase in FEV1 when they're on oral contraceptive therapy or birth control. But I do have to say these, are not, these were not statistically significant. The study is not done yet, so I really can't make any assumptions from this yet. We just noticed a little bit of a trend so far when we took a look at the data. Secondly, when we use um, the CFQR um, scale that's been designed by Dr. Quitner, we took a look at this and, and, gave, and, and administered this to patients at these different points in time in their, in their ovulatory cycles. Here at menses during ovulation and during the luteal phase again, and interestingly, again, found that during ovulation, their CFQ score was a little bit lower. Um, that actually, when you took out just the women who've done all the cycles of the oral contraceptive therapy, that actually highlighted quite a bit and improved while they were on birth control. And so, in general, the higher the score, the better, which is, again, interesting that it's pointing to a little bit of a trend towards people feeling better when they're on oral contraceptive therapy. But this is a very small number of patients yet for us to make any major conclusions. We hope by the end of the study, will at least have a, a legitimate hypothesis. We also took a quick look at the women at their ovulation point where their estrogen would be the highest versus the men that were in the study. And this was quite interesting in that we did find that the males had a much higher um, CFQR score relative to the females. So it'll be interesting once the study is done and, and analyzed to see what does this really end up showing. A few other things that we've looked, taken a quick look at are the number of neutrophils in the sputum of these patients. And when we again just look at the women um, when they're at their highest point of estrogen versus the men, um, both in terms of absolute and percent of neutrophils, we at least see a trend towards there being an increased number of neutrophils in the women, but not yet statistically significant as the study is not done. Um, and we look at markers of inflammation such as TNF-alpha and IL-1 beta, both pro-inflammatory markers, and again saw this trend of being higher in the women at the points of high estrogen relative to the men. So from this, the other study that we have ongoing that's very similar to this is we're actually studying the women in our clinic as they get pregnant, we're capturing them, um, and we're not doing any intervention on these women at all, just looking at them at the, um, during the first, week of, first trimester of pregnancy, second and third, collecting very similar points in terms of lung function, questionnaires, sweat testing, sputum for inflammatory markers, and a variety of other things to see, is there a difference when people are stable and well, is there a measurable difference in inflammatory markers or different things that we can, we can find? So currently, we only have about five women, I think, in the last year and a half who've, who've um, enrolled in the study and been pregnant. And I think as they continue, we'll learn more. And my real goal is if these pilot studies show something important, then I think we really need to look at this at a national level, because I don't think a single center like ours can really gain all the information that we need. We need everyone um, across the country to be participating in this. But I think it's a lot of money to do these studies, and so we really need some good solid pilot data before we can justify doing a bigger study. All right, so just to summarize what's known and not known, so I think I demonstrated there's a good amount of preclinical data out there to suggest that estrogen at a cell level may be deleterious 
both as a pro-inflammatory um, instigator in impacting air surface liquid and maybe even affecting epithelial ion channel transport. There's also some, some brewing clinical data to suggest that there's an association between estrogen and specifically CF exacerbations. Um, what's not known, and what I mentioned earlier, is really what is the impact of oral contraceptive therapies, what's the impact of pregnancy, and what's the impact of these on the pathophysiology specifically of CF lung disease, but I think we need to learn about other organs as well. Um, and then there's a lot of other questions that I, I didn't address at all, but what's the impact of sex hormones on homoptysis? I often get asked that question as there are descriptions of what's called catamenial homoptysis where people, women in particular homoptysize at different points um, in hormone fluctuation that I don't think we understand yet. What's the impact of hormones on um, clot formation? There is thought to be an increased risk of clot formation in CF patients, particularly when, when a catheter is in, and would putting people on any form of birth control impact that? What's the impact on bone density and different things. So I think there's a lot of information that's still void that we need to focus on. And I think the other big one that I didn't talk about much again was testosterone. So as I mentioned earlier, testosterone low levels are thought to be low in adolescent CF men, not everybody, but in some. And should we supplement that? And I know in addition, there is an increasing trend of men taking additional testosterone supplementation. There's all these clinics out there now administering testosterone, which may have some benefits, but is that the right thing to do? And I don't think we know that yet. So the real goal of what I'm hoping to achieve with some of these studies and hopefully the whole community is really one, to narrow this sex-based um, disparity in CF, improve the health not just of women, but of men. All of these hormone receptors are, are present in both men and women. They're just upregulated and stimulated by the ligands that are around them, so can we capture them in the right environment to affect that? Can we develop it? If it's an estrogen receptor antagonist that'll be beneficial, can we develop that? And if so, my guess is we would have to administer it nebulized because I don't think giving that systemically would be good for all the other off-target effects. And if we try to deliver it from a nebulized standpoint, how are we going to get it past the biofilm? How are we going to get it to the right cells? I think all the things that we heard about last night, how are we going to impact what, what we need to impact? Um, and then again, can we benefit both men and women for this? Though we want to narrow this disparity, we want to help everybody. So, so what can we do to, to make a difference? And then I do want to um, give a shout out to Dr. Emily Godfrey, who I just met today and actually was really nice to update me on, on these new um, guidelines that came out. So the CDC actually publishes um, eligibility criteria on who should be receiving oral contraceptive therapy. And she made me aware that just this week, I guess yesterday, a new publication came out from the CDC about oral contraceptive use. And for the first time, they really mentioned cystic fibrosis in there and that we need to be aware of some of the, the potential things that we need to think about when giving oral contraceptive therapy to CF women. So if you haven't read this, I know she or I could give you this citation where they want you to think about things such as the impact on venous thromboembolism, the impact on bone disease. They actually even mention um, that some drugs, including drugs such as Lumicaftor, may impact the efficacy of oral contraceptive therapy. So, so there's a lot of nice information that I'm glad the, the CDC picked up on and published as well. So, um, so thank you for that. Um, so just to end, I'd like to acknowledge a lot of people who've helped me work on this and have interest in this. My lab group, who spent, who spent the last, I guess, five or six years now really focusing on this topic and working hard to hope hopefully find some important answers. Our research coordinators who've been um, recruiting all of our patients and our generous patients who've done this, these studies, which are very difficult as they have to come in three or four times within a month to be seen at the right point in time. Some of my collaborators, both at UT Southwestern and Washington University in St. Louis. There's um, the CFT, CFFT labs, um, both the labs in Cleveland that have helped me with a lot of the sputum cytology in Denver that are helping do the inflammatory biomarker analysis and the microbiome analysis of the sputum, and then funding I've received from the NIH Gilead Sciences and the CF Foundation. So thank you very much. I hope I didn't go over time. No, you're fine. Okay, thank you, Dr. Jane. We do have time for uh, a few questions, and I think we could all sing along to this now. I have to remind you to limit your question to one per person, and when asking a question, speak into the microphone, and a volunteer will uh, adjust and clean the mic for you. So, questions? Hi, thank you uh, so very much. That was just uh, very informative, and thank you and your colleagues for your work. Oh, my pleasure. Um, anecdote. Speaking, I certainly noticed that when my uh, child with CF went into puberty, things became very, very, very difficult for her. And um, 
and certainly as she goes through her menses cycle every month as an adult, her health literally waxes and wanes with that cycle. So antidotally speaking, everything that you've said is something that I've always thought, well, this is the reality of a young woman with cystic fibrosis. So as you were speaking about um, the birth control possibilities, but the first thing that came to my mind, of course, was the whole bone density issue and the osteoporosis. So my question is, how does the birth control pill give a person with cystic, a woman with cystic fibrosis advantage in that it's a constant, um, it's a regulation of the estrogen at certain times and therefore you can predict how you're going to feel and how you can treat yourself. I mean, putting aside the, the, the contraindications of, um, birth control pills and any other kinds of uh, medications, putting aside all that and putting aside bone density issues and osteoporosis. But actually, if a, if a, a woman with CF is on birth control, does that then provide them with a more even disbursement of estrogen through a course of time, as opposed to the 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 peaks and flows that would come without it. Yes, so that's a that's a great question. So um, thank you. So first off, um, one I can't say that I know yet and can, can say whether whether birth control or oral contraceptive therapy is good or bad for CF. I think we have a lot to learn about that question still. But in terms of your question on what it's doing, so some of it depends on which birth control form you're using. There's all sorts of different variations out there right now. We specifically chose a form that was a combination of estrogen, progesterone in our study, et cetera. But in general, if you just wanna generalize most, most birth control, the idea is that with the amount of, of hormone that you're receiving in these birth controls, they're gonna suppress endogenous hormone fluctuations. So you will, for the most part, receive steady state um, hormone that will suppress your endogenous hormones such that you that a woman would stay low level throughout most of the ovulatory cycle. And so, so that's the idea is that in theory, if a woman took certain types of oral contraceptive therapy, her hormones would not fluctuate and actually would drop to levels that may be as low as that of men on a general basis. And people don't think that because when you're receiving a hormone, hormone therapy, they think, oh, well, then I'm getting estrogen, I'm getting, and that's true, but part of its goal is just to suppress your endogenous levels. That's very different than hormone replacement therapy that's received postmenopausally. This is all when you're talking about oral contraceptive therapy premenopausally. Is that all, does that answer your question? Very much. Yeah. Okay, okay, great. Great talk. Thanks. Um, so would it make sense for women to increase their treatments during when they're having their period? So I think the point at which they increase their therapies, we don't know yet. But that's actually, that's a great thought. If we were to find out that at the time of menses is where people do worse, we got to do something right there. I don't think, one, we know where that time is yet. But, but yes, I think we've got to do something. And, you know, the other thought I thought when, if we were to develop some sort of treatment, it may not have to be that this is one of those every single day treatments. Maybe you're right that at that little point where people are worse is where we need to do something different. But, but yes, I mean, and I think the thing is, I don't know that the actual, actually when one's having their period is actually when your hormones are at their lowest. Yet, I do have to say that anecdotally, just like you mentioned, many patients say they feel worse then. Then I have other patients that say they feel worse during ovulation. Then there's those that say they feel worse before their period. And so, so that's the whole point of what we're trying to gain is where is that bad point? I think once we know that, then we can focus on what can we do about it. I think increasing treatments is certainly one possibility. And I think the other is hopefully is there some sort of modulation to the hormone we could do then that's not going to affect the rest of the body that would improve them. Right. But, but I think that's a great point. I guess it, before you get to that point, would it be advisable for people to sort of be aware that that might be a good idea? Y yes. I think the hard thing is I don't, I can't say I know where that point is yet. Right. So, and, and then you, you know, I mean, if you tell someone to increase their treatments and you don't know where to tell them and they have to do it all the time, it's right. not likely going to be something they can achieve. That's just really hard to say that. Right. And I don't want to go on telling, one, I don't want to discourage women. I think women can do awesome, but, and it's not every woman that's necessarily going to have this, 
this potential disadvantage. And so to tell them that as a woman, you need to do more therapies or you need to do more therapies at this point in time, I just don't think I have the information to say that yet. So I don't want to yet make people change what they're doing until I have really good data to support that. Um, and I think during pregnancy, we know it's a very hard time for women in general, um, and that's a time that we certainly ask people to increase their therapies, but whether or not that's hormonally related or you know, physiology of the, the abdomen changing during pregnancy, I don't think we know that either, but I think it's also a time where you can motivate someone differently when they're pregnant to change their therapies, and they can understand that's a finite window that we're asking people to change their therapies as opposed to a lifetime change. So at least that's my perspective now. I've been very hesitant, and I have lots of women ask, because especially my patients who know that we're interested in this, ask me about birth control, ask me about the impact on their cycles, et cetera, and I've, I've been pretty hesitant to say anything yet because I don't think we yet have the data to know exactly what to say, but we've got to get it, and I think we're pretty close. Thanks. Oh, and I, I'm sorry, I failed to mention too, I apologize that, I, no, no, please, please do come. I apologize that tomorrow I'm not gonna be able to stay for the expert panel, it's my child's birthday and I promised to get back to Dallas to take him to a baseball game, but I'll be here all day if you guys have any questions or wanna discuss anything, I would love to meet you all. Hi, okay. <laughs> I have a 26 year old daughter and she has been on birth control now for about six years on the lower strain one because we realized uh, early on that she was doing so much worse when she was on her period. And ever since she has been on the birth control, she's evened out and it's much easier. So this is just an anecdotal evidence, but I think uh, you are on a good track. Yeah, I think that, and I, you know, I have heard that from others. And again, I think at least that one paper that came out in the New England Journal, that's a very prominent medical journal, and it distinctly showed a little bit of benefit in terms of exacerbations with oral contraceptive therapies, but it, it had some criticism, and I don't think one paper can change what we do in terms of practice yet, but I think that's a really important thing, and I actually hope that what my other hope is that if we can get enough of this literature, then we can get some of this data into the registry because if we start tracking oral contraceptive therapy in the registry, point of menarche in the registry, then as a community, we can learn about it much faster. I think as a single center and different centers out there that are interested in this, we're struggling to put it all together into the information we need to really be able to advise people. Hey, that was an amazing talk. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, I guess, uh, I was really fascinated by your research, and it started making me think about estrogen blockers like tamoxifen, so we use that a lot in the cancer research that I'm involved in, and are there any case studies to do with other kinds of estrogen blockers or women who have CF who are also on tamoxifen or anything like that? No, so that's a, that's a really good question. And actually, lung cancer is the farthest along in terms of treatment with estrogen receptor modulators. And interestingly, um, so they started with tamoxifen. What's interesting about tamoxifen is it's actually got combination receptor blocker and agonist activity. Mm -hmm. So they're starting to move away from that into some other pure estrogen receptor blockers. And there are, there are pre-developed agents out there that, that are being used in other diseases. Um, to my knowledge, it has not been used in CF yet at all. Um, I, my guess if I were to, to just look at the literature and what's happening is the first disease that may start to try it for an airway disease is likely asthma because they're the furthest along and having really followed this well and they're a big population that can be studied at a, at a larger level. But, you know, I think what's tricky is um, they're delivering that systemically in lung cancer. And, and I, I'm really hesitant to say that that's the way we should go with, with general other illnesses, especially lifetime illnesses, because I think there's a lot of data to suggest that these hormones do good things in some organs, bad things in some organs, and for us to just start manipulating that lifelong is gonna be tricky. So I really think that we should try to focus on a nebulized inhaled version of some of these modulators, but that's not developed yet. Um, so we're hoping if we get enough data that that's something we could move towards someone helping us develop or someone developing. Great, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jane.